Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 15. This is God's word. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound not trumpet, because before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be pleased, praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what the right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but God's word abides forever. Let's pray. O oh Lord, please stand among us in your reason power. Please open our eyes that we may see wondrous things in your law, not just for entertainment, but for empowerment, that we would leave this place enabled, strengthened, to do that which is in your will. We pray for those who are not born again. Please have mercy on them, even as you've had upon us who are saved. And kindly grant that they would not just see your holiness, their sinfulness and your wrath that is coming upon them, that they would see, but that they would also see the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would flee to him for their salvation. And so, Lord, we pray, bless the preaching of your word, both in the pulpit and in the seats, in the pews, and kindly grant that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable to you, O God. We please ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this would be the third sermon on uh, chapter 6. And we've seen that in chapter 6, we are being called there in verse 1 to a life of sincerity when it comes to the practice of our righteousness. The Lord says in verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. The beware, the warning, is an indication that this is possible even for the disciple. It is possible for the disciple to be engaged in acts of righteousness with the intention of bringing glory upon themselves. We also do recognize that it's not just a possibility, but it is something that has serious consequences. For to fail to 
have a reward from the Father is to fail at a great thing. And so that's the backdrop against which then the three illustrations there in chapter 6, verse 1 to 18 are being discussed. So the first illustration in the practice of righteousness and the call to do it with a Godward gaze rather than a human view is in the area of giving. And the call is in your giving. Leave for the audience of one. And then there is in verse 5 to 15, the practice of righteousness in the area of prayer. And likewise here, based on that fulcrum in verse 1 of chapter 6, in your prayer, pray as unto the audience of one. And then in fasting, likewise, verse 16, 17, and 18, in your fasting, fast as unto God. So in all the practice of righteousness that as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ you'd be engaged in, your gaze should be upward. Whether it is a horizontal practice of righteousness where you are doing things for the benefit of your neighbor, as in the case of giving, serve your neighbor with the view of bringing glory to God. Whether it is a practice of righteousness that basically touches on a vertical relationship, one between you and God directly, as in the case of prayer, focus on that aspect of righteousness for the glory of God. And whether it is one that is inward focused, as in the case of fasting, because there are practices of righteousness that focus on the self, in the case of self-control here and self-abasement, do that. Look inward. Focus at yourself for the glory of God. And so we must not forget that these three illustrations are given to emphasize to you and to me the need to be cautious. Sincerity in almsgiving, in prayer, and in fasting. Today, as we look at prayer, you will see that the text has prohibitions and it has prescriptions when it comes to prayer. You will notice that two great faults have been identified in this section. Verse 5 and 6 identifies guilt in prayer that arises from the pursuit of vain glory. And you'd be told, do not pursue vain glory. And then verse 7 and 8, we'll talk about guilt arising from vain repetitions when we come to prayer. Allow me then to bring to you the four points that I have. The first one that I would like you to observe is the priority of prayer. In one way or another, we all have some sort of schedule for next week. You are having plans when you leave this place and when you start your work week to do this and that, to study this and that, to attend this meeting and that other meeting, to do this thing for yourself, for your spouse, for your family, for, for parents, whatever you have prioritized to do in the coming week. The question I would have for you is does your schedule have space for prayer? Is there a place that you have intentionally decided that you will pray from? A time when you will pray. The Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascribes great meaningfulness to prayer. And as you look at this particular text, whether by his exhortations, whether by the emphasis, and in other sections of the New Testament, by his example and his emissaries, you'd see that the Lord 
puts a high premium on prayer. 23 times it is recorded for us in the Gospels that he went apart and prayed. In this particular section that we have read, you will notice a number of times the emphasis on the importance of prayer is, is clear. And when you pray, is repeated three times. When you pray is repeated three times, verse 5, and when you pray, verse 6, but when you pray, verse 7, not if you pray, but when you pray. And then in verse 9, there is the instruction, pray the, then like this. And in verse 11, the fact that we are to pray, give us this day our daily bread, surely does indicate that we are praying daily. If we are to pray for our daily bread. So verse 5, when you pray, shows that the Lord is taking it for granted that if you are his disciple, you will pray. Prayer is taken for granted. No man can be in the kingdom of heaven who does not pray. To talk about a Christian who doesn't pray, who will not pray, is a paradox. It's an a thing that should not exist. It's like talking about me giving you an assignment to go find a living man who is not breathing. If you can find one who is alive and is yet not breathing, then it would be possible to find a living Christian who does not pray. Christians pray. Personal prayer he is here supposed to be the duty and the practice of all disciples. Secondly, the Lord addresses the issue of pretense in prayer. And here we need to realize that the Lord knows your motives in prayer. And he will judge you concerning them. In verse 5, the text says, And when you pray, you must not, that's an imperative, be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners. Why? That they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, you go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. It is not simple publicity, the simple publicity of prayer, which is being condemned here in verse 5. Public prayer may be op offered in a number of circumstances. But what is being condemned here is showiness, ostentation, seeking praise, the praise of others. Prayer, like charitable giving, should be done in secret. And the end of praying in secret is, is not merely for the purpose of not sharing what you're praying about. But as we said last time, secrecy here in the practice of righteousness is a safeguard to guarantee sincerity. So we are not being prohibited from public prayer. 
what is being prohibited here is praying for the purpose of public recognition. The place of prayer is not the biggest problem here. The motive of prayer is what is wanting. And Jesus is acknowledging that these people who pray to receive the praise of man will receive the honor, or they may receive the honor and respect from others, but that is all that they would receive. Observe a number of things. Look at the practice of these hypocrites. What is their greatest aim? What is their purpose here as they pray? It is to be those who receive the commendation of their neighbors. So they are self-focused even when they are talking to God. So on one hand, their prayers are soaring upwards, and yet their eyes are gazing downwards. So they are praying and praying. They have you as their prey, and they want you to praise them. It's a most ugly thing. And that disciples are being told, beware of this, means that we need to realize this ugly thing is possible for you and me who are Christians. Think about the places where they pray. In their pretense, where do they pray? The place of honor, the place of the assemblies, in the synagogue. And they pray in the corners of the streets so that people can take notice of them. One imagines standing at the corner of a street ensures maximum observance by people on both streets. So it's not just those who are passing, but even those who are not passing but are on those streets, you are in their gaze as you pray. Even the posture is spoken of here. They pray standing. Now it's not sinful to pray standing, but in this particular context, it is not hard to see that the standing is again to attract attention to self. Kneeling, being the more humble and reverent posture in prayer sort of reminds us of the Pharisee who stood by himself and thus prayed I'm not like this tax collector then there is pride these people are haughty in their prayer their pretense is seen again there they love to pray where they love to stand and pray. It's not that they love to pray itself for its own sake, but they love to pray because it gives them an opportunity to make themselves noticed. They love to pray so that they may be seen by men that they may be seen by others. Their love for praying is not because of a desire to be accepted by God, but that fellow human beings would admire and applaud them. What is the product of their prayer? They have a reward. They have a recompense, but it is not one from God. They are, pray they are praying, earns them a very poor recompense. When these people come to pray, they've not come to pray, they've come to purchase. 
they've come to purchase your clapping and your accolades. Their mindset is, what will I get out of this prayer? Will there be a good word from fellow servants? Dear friends, what's more preferable? What's preferable? The well done of a fellow servant, but the well done of your master. Is it to men that we pray? Is it from men that we expect an answer? Are fellow human beings to be our judges? People who, like us, are dust and ashes? Should our eyes focus on them? When we pray, do we pretend? In our worship, our synagogue worship, our corporate worship, we must avoid everything that tends to make our personal devotion a center of attraction. What then should we do instead of praying in the synagogues and in the street corners to be seen? The prescription is enter into your closet. Enter into a private place and pray. We see examples of the Lord Jesus Christ retreating to the mountain or Peter to the housetop, or Isaac, in Genesis 24, 63, he went to the field to meditate. In such a private place of prayer, no one will observe you. You will avoid showiness. The temptation to showiness will be done away with in that scenario where you are unobserved by fellow human beings. There are other benefits. You will be undisturbed. You will avoid distraction. You will be unheard by others. And because others are not hearing you, you will be freer. There will be greater freedom to be open with God and not to put forth a facade and to pretend as you pray. Yet, in these circumstances where man, fellow man, would not be listening to you or listening in into your prayers, you cannot avoid the fact that someone will take notice of you. God will take notice of you. So the call here is not to stop praying because as we pray, we may sin uh, in our pretense. Knowingly, we may do that or sadly, we may slide into that unknowingly. The solution is not stop praying. The solution is pray in the proper way. Two wrongs would not make are right. Instead of praying to be seen by men, make it your goal to pray to be seen by your Father, your Heavenly Father, who is in secret. Make it your goal, unlike the Pharisees, to pray to God rather than to men. Pray to God, pray to him as a father. And not just a father, but your father. He is ready to hear you. He is ready to answer you. He is graciously inclined to pity, to help, and to uphold you. 
So the call here is clear from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not pray to be seen by others. This does not forbid public preaching, praying rather. Moses, Daniel, Ezra, and others prayed publicly. The Lord Jesus Christ allowed the disciples to see him praying. The apostles and the first Christians also gathered to pray together. They had each other pray for boldness in Acts chapter 4. That when they prayed, they simply did not care what man thought if God was happy with the prayers. Let's not be actors. Let's not be those who think that fake it until you make it can be brought into this realm of dealings with God. Hypocritical prayers are prayers that are not blessed. When we pray in secret, our goal is to have the eye of God. He is with you in the closet when no one else is there. Call to him at such times. Call to him by secret prayer. God sees in secret, we've been told in verse 6, a God is a God who told Nathaniel in John chapter 1, verse 48, while you're still under the fig tree, I saw you. Our God is the God of Acts chapter 9, verse 11. As Ananias is being sent to Paul, the Lord tells him, go to such and such a street, you'll find Paul praying. That is the God we come to in prayer. He does not just see in secret, which should be an encouragement to the true believer who is not hypocritical and a warning and a scary thing to the hypocrite, that he will reward you and that it is called a reward needs to not be thought of as God paying a debt to us. It is a reward of grace. We are beggars, and he owes us nothing. And so when he rewards, it's a reward of grace. The reward is not specified. But the purpose of true prayer goes beyond answering the particular requests that we are making. We'll talk a bit about that in the next point. So if in your prayers you are blind to God, then God will be blind to your prayer. These hypocrites here are pictured as people who pray with at most one eye. The other eye is focused not on God, but on their reputation. This is such a profane thing. And we need to see its ugliness. In a time when we are more showy than ever because of social media, we need to be careful not to profane our time of communion with God by having one eye focused on him and the other eye focused on fellow man. So pretense is a thing being 
prohibited here. Another thing being prohibited is pagan practices in prayer. The Lord is saying he finds vain mechanics in prayer. An insult to his perfections. Look at verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Why do the Gentiles heap up empty phrases? Polylogia. It's, it's a word that it's one of those onomatopoeic words where the word itself comes with, you know, a word like boom. You, you hear it and you have a picture on, based on what's, what you hear the sounding or the pronunciation of the word. These people think, verse 7, that they will be heard for their many words. The Lord says, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So here we are being told when we come to pray, do not come with vain repetitions. Empty words, a heap of empty words, quite a phrase there, idle babbling. Doing a babbling of the same words again and again. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying, do not. Do not babble when you come to pray. When we come to pray, dear friends. We need to pray as those who are instructed in the scriptures. We are not coming to pray to a reluctant deity from whom we want to extract blessings through hook or crook. And this especially in joint prayer, because when it comes to pretense in prayer, the you there is singular. You go into your closet. But here you might not notice it, but the you there in verse 7 is plural. When you pray, and even for your father is plural. And so it is possible that this is a sin that we are more prone to when it comes to joint prayer or corporate prayer. Words become necessary in corporate prayer. When you are praying corporately, you are praying and you want those who are listening to say a meaningful amen. And so words become necessary. In such times, we must be careful not to use vain repetition. What is the problem here? What is the fault? The fault here is making prayer the important service and spiritual exercise of prayer into something that is mere leap labor. Instead of it being wholehearted, instead of it being a service of the soul, and we heap up empty phrases. And so we need to be careful when we pray together on our Thursday prayer meetings, when I make a note to myself, when I stand here to pray as an elder, uh, I need to take note of this. Empty phrases have been 
condemned. There is a do not attached to it. Does this mean that all repetition in prayer is condemned? No. What is being condemned is empty repetitions, vain repetitions, one translation would put it. We do know that in Matthew 26, 44, Christ himself prayed saying the same words. But they were not empty. They were out of more than ordinary fervor and zeal. We do know that Daniel chapter 9, verse 18 and 19, repeated the prayer. And Psalm 136 has a very elegant repetition of the same words. So what is being proscribed here, what is being prohibited, is not so much the repetition of the same words as it is the senseless multiplication of words in prayer. It is sad that the very prayer that our Lord gave as an antidote to vain repetitions is so abused today by people who are superstitious concerning the Lord's prayer. There are many who repeat it vainly using beads in a superstitious way, thinking that such vain repetitions would extract an answer from God. It is a characteristic of it's a characteristic feature of heathen devotion to have empty phrases in their prayers. Whether it's the time of Baal on the Mount Carmel contest in 1 Kings 18, or even in our modern times, empty phrases are a mark of people who are not in Christ. Religion that is outside Christ would have empty phrases. So I'm not saying don't use the same words in prayer. But what this text is saying is those same words must not be empty. And we need to look at our, how we pray and ask ourselves, are we still praying like we used to pray 10 years ago before we were as instructed in the scriptures as we are today? The other thing that is being prescribed here in verse 7 is many words, much speaking, you can see it there. This much speaking, it's not just empty words, but there's also much speaking, many words there. Out of pride, out of superstition, out of an opinion that God needs to be informed. There are people who pray like God does not know what's going on. And they need to inform him what the newspaper headline is today. You see why I am saying it is an insult on the perfections of God to pray like the pagans. There are those who pray like God needs to be argued with. There are those who just love to hear themselves talk. And so their prayers are marked by many words. But the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, don't do this. Don't come with empty phrases or needless words. And he gives the reason. Why? For your father knows what you need before you ask. 
He does not need to be informed of your wants any more than he needs to be untwisted. I say that respectfully to attend to your needs by your incessant speaking. So let's not babble when we come to pray. Because behind this kind of approach to prayer is the thought that such a manner of praying will cause the gods to hear the prayers. Because this is how the Gentiles think. The gods are busy. Get on their face. And Elijah would chide the prophets of Baal, even telling them, maybe your God has gone to the toilet. Pray harder. This is not to say that all long prayer is forbidden. We do know in Luke 6, 12, that the Lord Jesus Christ prayed all night. Solomon prayed long prayers. There is indeed times when long prayers are appropriate when our errands and our affections are extraordinary. But to merely prolong the prayer as if it would make it more pleasing or it would prevail better with God is here condemned. Praying is not condemned. No, what we have here condemned is much speaking. It is very clear. Solomon has a portion for us in Ecclesiastes 5.2. Let your words be few. Tells us, consider your words. Weigh them well as you come into God's presence. Let's not be like the prophets of Baal. Oh Baal, oh Baal, hear us, was the vain petition made by these prophets of Baal. Prayer is not leap labor. Your father, your father knows what you need. How many times as a parent has your child only said, my head, my head, and you sprang into action? Now if you, Scripture would tell us, if we who are evil will not give our children stones when they ask for bread or snakes when they ask for fish, how much more would our Heavenly Father respond to our need? Of course, we need to realize that the godly parent will not give a snake if the child asks for it, or a stone if the child asks for it. No matter how long the child asks for the snake, praise be to God, he will not give you a snake. If praying was a guarantee that whatever we asked for would be given to us, then I would be very scared to pray. I thank God that he does not grant a lot of foolish things that I ask for, that I even ask for fervently. But in the midst of all that, his wise denials, we do know that all things will work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Finally, prescriptions for prayer. I've already gone through a number. 
that the Lord gives us the manner of prayer that pleases him. He says, pray then like this, or some translations, pray then after this manner. Not necessarily in these words, because there are those who have taken this to mean just vainly repeat what is known as the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer has six petitions. The first three petitions have to do exclusively with God. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. There's almost a descending scale there. So it's, it's almost like if you worked it backwards, God's will is done, it would be seen in the coming of his kingdom and his name would be hallowed. The remaining petitions have to do with ourselves. Give us our daily bread, forgive us our debts, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Now these aspects of prayer that touch on us somewhat have an ascending skill from the bodily wants of every day to our final deliverance from evil. God willing, at some point in the future, we may take some more time and look at the Lord's Prayer and look at each of those petitions. But some things can be said today briefly. Look at the opening address of the Lord's Prayer. Says, pray then like this, our Father. Wow. That's big. That's very big. The religions of the world do not have this kind of filial relationship with God. The Muslims would have 33 beads or a multiple of 66 beads, or a multiple of 99 beads in their bead, beads for prayer. And they would help them to pray as they mention the names of God, or the attributes of God, creator, ruler, and uh, whatever other attributes they mention. But none of those 99 describes God as Father. The Jew would have this as something that for them would be a no-no. Father, Abba, Father. That kind of filial thing was between man and God was a thing not even to be thought of. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, pray like this. Address God as your Father. And don't forget that he is your father who is in heaven. He is holy. And so come before him with reverence. Come before him with absolute reverence, a rejoicing and a trembling, all mixed together. And then in your order of praying, don't start with what you need, Start with what God deserves. You don't start with, give us this day our daily bread. You start with what God deserves. And then he says in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. And this is helpful to me because it shows me that the purpose of prayer is not simply for the answer of prayer. Because God will give daily bread to those who don't even pray about it. So why then are we praying? 
if he is going to give this bread to those who pray and those who don't, what's the purpose of prayer? You realize that it's not just to get your daily bread. Communion here is a very important thing in prayer. A reminding of self that you depend on God is a very important thing that we gain from praying. And if a Christian, therefore, will neglect prayer, they neglect something very, very important. The last thing I would say about this prayer or praying as we think about living for the audience of one is realize the comprehensiveness of the prayers, the comprehensive nature of this prayer. Nothing is left out. Everything is covered. We don't hide some things from God as we pray. We bring our hearts to him. We bear out our hearts to him. We don't pretend either by saying things that we don't, we shouldn't be saying or by holding back things that we ought to be saying. This is an address to God as you pray. May the Lord help us to know how to pray. And in our praying, may the Lord enable us to pray as unto the audience of one. May I encourage you to pray. J.I. Parker reminded us that what a person thinks of when they think of God as their father will tell us a lot about that person. If God is your father and you do not want to commune with him because of the trifles, the, the, the things of this world, then we haven't weighed accurately the weight of that privilege. Let us be a people of prayer. Be a man, be a lady of prayer. Let us be a church that prays. Don't miss Thursday prayers for no good reason. It's an hour or an hour, an hour and a half. Please schedule to attend. And let's all come together before the Lord and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.